But tonight I want to talk with you about the prayer that will raise the dead. Where do you think that is in the scripture? Prayer that will raise the dead. Maybe Lazarus? Sir? Lazarus? Exactly. He said Lazarus. John 11, the 11th chapter of John. And uh, before I read that scripture, you know that story. <coughs> Uh, Jesus had a home that he loved to visit, and the home was in the town of Bethany. Uh, Bethany uh, was uh, just uh, a little small town, and apparently he visited two sisters and a brother who lived there. Not a, not a normal nuclear family with mom and dad and children running around. Three adult <coughs> siblings, Mary, <coughs> Martha, and Lazarus. Uh, I don't, I don't know that the Bible doesn't say what I'm getting ready to say right now, but it Im implies this, that, uh, that Martha was more of the homemaker and house tender and uh, so forth. And so, I, I, I mean, that, the Bible does teach us that. Cook and, and uh, she loved to uh, have guests in and all of that. And I'm thinking that probably Martha was the one who kept the parents until they passed away and then the parents died and Martha still had the home place. I don't know what Mary had done with her life, uh, but apparently she was back home now, uh, living there in the household. And uh, Mary, Mary may have been out in the world and then when she met Jesus, he totally changed her life and, uh, because she was certainly a changed uh, person. And then Lazarus was their brother uh, and he lived there as well. So three single adults uh, living in that home in Bethany, and it was a place Jesus loved. He, uh, he visited there often. Sometimes when the pressures of the enemies of the cross were great on Jesus, we find him in that home in Bethany. Uh, it, was, it was a special place uh, to him. And so on this occasion, Lazarus got sick, you remember? Sick unto death. And what did Mary and Martha do? What any of us would do? They called on Jesus. Jesus, come. Lazarus is sick. And so Jesus just headed right out, right? No, not, not right. Jesus didn't. He, he tarried. Why in the world did Jesus wait when Mary and Martha issued a uh, plea for him to come and see about their sick brother? We don't know that. The Bible does not tell us why, except as the story unfolds, we understand why Jesus often waits. Why, why do we have a, a time of waiting? Why, why do we ask Jesus about something that we're so passionate and sincere and fervent about, and he, he <laughs> seems to wait? Well, again, we don't know, but we do know that there, there's a long-range reason for his waiting. There's, you know, somebody said Jesus was never in a hurry, <coughs> but he was never late. Uh, so didn't have to be in a hurry. He was always on time, and he was on time in this story, too. Even though Lazarus had died... And Jesus arrived after the death. Uh, he was getting ready to do something uh, very special. You remember that the Bible says that Martha met Jesus as he was coming near their home. Outside the home, she met him. Mary didn't. That's a little bit different from the way we usually see Mary and Martha. <coughs> Martha's usually in the house doing stuff, and Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, or she's, uh, uh, she's listening to his, his uh, messages and so forth. But now, what happened? You think Mary is just kind of trying to figure out why Jesus didn't come? You think she's sorting things through? The Bible doesn't tell us exactly why, but it's Martha who met him. But you remember Martha just saying, Jesus, if you'd been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. A lot of times we go through things like, Lord, Lord Jesus, how, how did this come about? If, if you had only, you know, if, 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 if only. Uh, and, and then she, you know, she was going through that. But then you remember Jesus comforted her by saying to her, you know, don't, uh, don't fret, Lazarus is going to live again. And she said, oh yes, I know, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll be raised again the last day. She believed in the resurrection. She believed that that was going to happen. And, and Jesus said, hey, I am the resurrection and I am the life. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And, and of course, then she she confessed Christ and who he is, and it was a great act of confession. And then Martha had the opportunity to do a similar thing, and then that's when uh, we, we pick up the text. Uh, John chapter 11. Uh, let's just start with verse 38, and then I'll, I'll read you that prayer. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, 
came to the tomb where Lazarus was. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. I remember another cave with a stone against it, don't you? Mm -hmm. Lord Jesus' body himself put in a, in a, uh, a, a cave with a stone against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was dead, said to Jesus, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead for four days. You know, his body's stinking, Lord Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying. And here's our text. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who were standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And then you know the rest of the story. You might as well read that, verse 43. Then when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out, of the, came out bound head, head and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. Uh, you know, I've heard that you have too, that why Jesus stood outside the grave and called Lazarus' his name. Lazarus, come forth. Because if he just said, come forth, everybody in all the graves out there would have come uh, alive. And, uh, so, so Jesus specified Lazarus. He was raised from the dead. But the prayer that Jesus prayed is what I call the prayer that will raise the dead. Notice, first of all, it says, and Jesus lifted up his eyes. Notice where Jesus looked. He looked up. You know, I heard about a, a man who uh, looked down and found a $10 bill on the ground just kind of <coughs> laying in the dust, picked it up and wiped it off and put it in his pocket. And from then on, he started <coughs> walking around looking down on the ground. Just, you know, every, every time he's walking somewhere, he, he is looking down. Well, he, he found some things. I think according to the story, he didn't find another $10 bill. He found a lot of paper clips and a lot of nails and tacks and he found a lot of old uh, bad things that were thrown out and so forth. He found a lot of things, even though he didn't find a $10 bill. But he missed a lot of glorious days like today. He missed a lot of beautiful sunsets and sunrises. He missed beautiful clouds and blue skies. He missed a lot by just constantly looking down. And, you know, sometimes we, we tend to do that. We think about all the things that God has for us, and we just look, look down, look down. Uh, Jesus looked up in the, in the cemetery, out there where his friend Lazarus was buried. The Bible says, and Jesus lifted up his eyes. I think it was D.L. Moody who said, why does Jesus so often lift up his eyes? I think Moody said he was homesick, you know, just kind of <laughs> look, looking up at, at home for home. Uh, but here he's, he's, he's looking up. It was S.D. Gordon who said, Faith is blind except upward. It is blind to impossibilities and deaf to doubt. I love that. Blind to impossibilities and deaf to doubt. And it's blind except upward. And uh, that, that's what real, real faith is. And Jesus shows that here when he's getting ready to pray. He looks up. So notice where Jesus looked. I think a few weeks ago, I mentioned to you this, but I can't remember if I said this or not. When, when Dr. Charles Stanley first went to First Baptist Church in Atlanta, you may remember the history there. People, there, there was a great uprising against Dr. Stanley. He wasn't the same person who had been there for other years, other pastors, and he was different. And uh, so some people just had a campaign uh, against him. There was a uh, you know, there was a time where it seemed like maybe First Baptist were, Atlanta was going to split and they were going to get rid of Dr. Stanley. Well, of course, he's had all these years now. He's had a great ministry and unbelievable nationwide and worldwide teaching and preaching ministry. But one of the ladies in the church, who was one of those faithful ladies, called him to come and visit her. And he did visit in the home. And in her home was a picture of Daniel in the lion's den. And uh, you, you probably remember that picture from Sunday school quarterlies and so forth. Daniel's kind of standing there with his hands behind his back. The lines are all, all around him. And uh, the lady said, Dr. Sandy, I know what's going on at the church. I want you just to stare at that picture a little bit. 
And so he did. And she said, did you see it? And yes, I, I, I see it. And she said, Dr. Stanley, what is Daniel looking at? And he said, well, he's looking at the light up in the window. She said, yes. He's not looking at the lions. He's not looking at the dungeon. He's looking up at the, at the light. And she said, Dr. Stanley, don't look at the lions that are all around you. Don't look at the circumstances. You look at the light. And I'm assuming that's exactly what he did, and God gave him a long, long uh, ministry. Well, I think that when we're in the midst of it, we don't know what to do. Uh, we do what Jesus did. We look up. So that's the first part. Then it says, Father. So notice the second thing. Notice who Jesus addressed. Not only where he looked. He looked up. But who Jesus addressed. Father. You know, one of the endearing terms that Jesus uses for God is Father. Sometimes it says Righteous Father. Sometimes it says Holy Father. But that, that, endear, that endearment term, and I really think that's one of the very best titles that we can use for God, Father. He is our Father by us being born again into the family of God. He is our Heavenly Father. He is our Righteous Father, our Holy Father. We are His children. Galatians 4, 6, and 7 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And it's where the Apostle Paul speaks to us about that relationship that we have as father and child. And it says, Because you are sons, which means sons and daughters, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We are adopted into God's family, and we're born into God's family by the new birth, so we're doubly uh, God's. He, he, he becomes our father in, in both ways, and we can speak to him. Abba, uh, Abba is the same word that we'd use today for daddy. Daddy, father. That's what uh, Paul is saying uh, to us, that, that, that that's what we need to call him. And I need to know how to cut off my, I guess it's just ding every once in a while. It's just, it's just a call in on my. Just to push this button. Thank you, sir. Okay, good. Um, I might, uh, my daughter Melody is on the road uh, today, so she's probably calling in and it comes in on this laptop sometimes. So I'll cut that out of the video. Yeah, okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you for taking that out. Yes, sir. Uh, so the, the father-child relationship that we have with, with God is wonderful that we can we can use like that term, daddy, Abba, the closest kind of relationship. Now, some of us in the room and some listening on the phone may not have had an intimate, close, uh, personal, wonderful relationship with a father. Uh, and because of that, it might not uh, be as easy for you all who not had that as it would be for somebody who had a father, a dad who was genuine and real and authentic and loved you with a genuine love but when we hear all that the scripture teaches us about the love of God the love of our heavenly father we realize that we can we can talk in the most intimate way with him not just not just Jesus the begot, only begotten son but all of us who've been born into God's family can call our father abba daddy father papa and realize that he that God hears us as his children and I think, I think that's the best way. So notice who Jesus addressed. Father. And then notice how Jesus began his prayer. Father, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think it was S.D. Gordon writing about prayer who said that every prayer of ours ought to have a thanks not, K-N-O-T, somewhere in it. And he tells about this surgeon who would always do his surgery and then do the stitches and sew up uh, the wound after the surgery and there was in those days kind of a certain amount of, of knots that you always put on some uh, 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 you know a surger surgical wound and he always tied one more knot than was required in those days by medical science to uh, sew up a suture or sew up a, a wound and somebody once asked him why, why do you always tie that one more knot on the end of the surg surgical threads, and he said, it's my thanks knot. And you know, every prayer needs to have a thanks knot. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of doing this. I thank you for being the healer. I thank you for 
um, uh, allowing this surgery to be done. <coughs> and, and so here's Jesus standing outside the grave of a dear friend, and he starts off by saying, thank you. You know, there are several passages of Scripture, Ephesians 5.20, Philippians 4.6, Colossians 1.3, that say to us, every, every one of us <coughs> needs to have a, a grateful heart. We need to spend so much time in thanksgiving. You know, it's easy for us to look at the news. And, wow. Start off with the Nashville news and then go to the Tennessee news and the national news and the world news. And it's easy to think, boy, what is the world coming to? And look at all these killings and all this and all that. And I think it's easy to get into an attitude of grumbling and an attitude of negativity and, and so forth rather than an attitude of gratitude. And that's what Jesus shows us here in the midst of grief. And he did grieve. Jesus, outside the tomb, wept, uh, the Bible says. And I, I've heard people say, I wonder why he wept. He knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. But he wept because his friends were grieving. He wept because they were going through this sorrow. He wept because he was there in the place of death. Uh, Jesus' heart was broken, and so he was weeping. And yet he begins this prayer with, Father, thank you. I, I thank you. So that's, uh, to me, that's a pattern. That's uh, an example to us of how to begin our prayers with thanksgiving. And I think that every prayer ought to, if it doesn't begin with thanksgiving and praise, it ought to be, every prayer ought to include thanksgiving and praise. So where he looked, he had looked up. Who he addressed, he addressed the Father. How he began, he began with thanks. Thank you. And then notice what he knew. He said, thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. What did Jesus know? He knew that God had heard his prayers. God had heard. Uh, when we pray, shouldn't we be thinking about God's past provisions for us? You know, you think about, uh, you come and pray and say, Lord, uh, I need this, I need, I need that. But as we give him thanks, we ought to say, God, I, I got so close today to, in that, that traffic situation and somebody just almost, almost hit my car. Uh, Lord, last week, Lord, last year, Lord, when I was a little child, Lord, uh, when early in our married life, you know, you just think back on ways that God has provided for you. And here Jesus said, Lord, I know that you have heard me. I mean, Jesus thinks back on his, his ministry. He thinks back on times when the Father has, has heard and answered prayer in such a clear way. And I think that's what, uh, what Jesus knew. He knew that God hears his prayers and that God had heard and in fact that he always hears. He said, I know that you have heard me and I know that you always hear me. Uh, so if there's anything you and I need to know when we pray, it's that God hears our prayers. He hears and answers. He has heard in the past. He always hears. He always will hear and we can rest assured that that has happened. So um, where Jesus looked, he looked up. Who he addressed, he addressed the Father. How he began, he began with thank you. And then what he knew, he knew that God hears. And there's one last thing, and that is why Jesus prayed. And it says, so I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, mm. I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Why did Jesus pray? That others might believe. Why, why do you and I pray? We pray that others might believe. We, we intercede for neighbors. We intercede for friends. We intercede for family. Those of you who are parents, you intercede for your children. Those of us who are grandparents and great-grandparents, we intercede for our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren. Those who have relatives like nieces and nephews, cousins, uh, siblings, parents, grandparents, we, we intercede for them. We pray that they may believe, especially those who indicate that they're struggling with their faith, they're struggling with their belief. Part of our prayer life is to be for those who need to believe. Jesus said, I don't just pray this uh, for these 
who are standing by, I do that, but also that they may believe that you sent me. So our prayers are, are, are prayers that are to be uh, wide, widespread. Uh, we, you know, when we, when we bow in prayer, I mean, just like tonight, we've been around the world tonight. We've, we've had an opportunity to leave the fireside room, to leave those homes where people have called in, and to uh, include other people and to lift them up and to intercede for them. It's a, it's a marvelous thing that we can pray that they might believe. And so that's, that's the why of intercessory prayer. That's the reason that we pray, that others may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 3, is a, is a powerful word about prayer, where James is writing, and he says in chapter 4 and verse 3, You ask and do not receive, because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your own pleasures. Here James is saying to us, if, if our prayers are all self-centered, if our prayers are all just focused on ourselves and our family, and not on all those who need to believe, our prayers are amiss. They miss the mark. They, do not, uh, they are not effective as, as they need to be. So uh, we, that's, that's why we pray that others might believe. I, I want to I wanna close... We're thinking about two prayers. Uh, there's one that uh, became a real popular prayer just a few years uh, ago. In fact, a whole book was written about it. It's found in First Chronicles in the Old Testament in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. First Chronicles 4, 9 and 10. I'll turn there, and as soon as I start reading, you'll recognize how that was a prayer that was written about and a popular book uh, was written about it and so forth. First Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. And the Bible says this. Now Jabez, J-A-B-E-Z, was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. Jabez means pain or discomfort. And then Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, And here's the prayer of Jabez. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. He didn't want to live up to his name. He wanted uh, others not to be pained by him. So God granted him what he requested. Uh, that book that came out was a book about praying the prayer of Jabez, and it was a prayer that God would enlarge our territory, that his hand would be on us, that he would keep us from evil, and that we would not cause pain to others. And uh, became very popular. People began to say, well, I'm praying the prayer of Jabez, and uh, yeah, asking God to enlarge my business, enlarge my family, and enlarge my territory, my property. And it's almost a prayer of uh, uh, you know, uh, prosperity, uh, and there's nothing wrong with praying that God would prosper us if we're going to use it for his kingdom and for his, his glory. But I saw among believers this kind of attachment to the prayer of Jabez as if uh, I know God's going to enlarge my territory. I know he's going to prosper me. I know he's going to you know, bless my family and, and enlarge us. Uh, almost a self-centered prayer. So what I would say is the prayer of Jabez was a legitimate prayer. But the prayer of Jesus is a lot better. And so we, we move from the prayer of Jabez uh, to the prayer of Jesus. And that prayer uh, where Jesus looked up, where he addressed the Father, he began with thank you. He knew that God had heard and always here. And he prayed so that others might believe. To me, that's, uh, that's the right kind of praying. And that's the kind of praying that I want to do. So Jabez is the wrong kind of praying? No. Uh, but uh, Jabez is a shallower kind of praying than the prayer of Jesus that he prayed here uh, before he raised Lazarus from the dead. And then he called out, Lazarus, come forth. The, the dead got raised. Lazarus came forth and became a dangerous believer. You remember in the next chapter what happened? Uh, the Martha was fixing a meal so she was back to her uh, good work and uh, Mary was there and Lazarus was there 
And the Bible teaches us that the enemies of the cross, the enemies of Jesus, began to plot how they could kill Lazarus because now he had that powerful testimony that Jesus had raised him from the dead. So Jesus prays that prayer, raised Lazarus from the dead. He, uh, he was, uh, what is it somebody said? He was defeated, still had the grave clothes wrapped around him. Then he was dead, and then he was defeated, and then he was dangerous. So pretty good uh, steps for any of us as believers to come from death to life through Jesus Christ and then to get rid of those grave clothes and then to uh, bear a strong witness and a strong testimony for Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's pray together as we uh, wrap it up. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we are, uh, are amazed at your life and ministry, who you were, what you did, how you lived, the miracles that you performed, this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. But Lord Jesus, help us to remember that it began with that prayer at the graveside. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to know that that's where dead things come to life in our lives also. I don't know if some of us listening tonight have something that's terminal, something that's dying, something that's dead in our life. Maybe we're looking at a relationship that seems to be dead or maybe we're looking at a friendship or something about our health or our life. Maybe we even think about our own church, Lord, and how Dalewood has had times of such great life and glory, and yet now here we are in a time of, of struggle. But Father, thank you that there is a prayer that raises the very dead, and it's this prayer that Jesus prayed. And I pray that you'll give us the understanding to pray this kind of prayer in our life. May it always begin with thanksgiving and may it always conclude that others might be saved, that your name would be glorified as Jesus taught us that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it's being done in heaven. Dear Jesus, we come like your disciples and say to you, teach us to pray. <laughs> teach us to pray. Help us to pray a prayer that raises the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you for thank you. joining us for the study. And thank you, Jesus, for teaching us to pray.